Okay, my write the chapter for Chuck's book on trauma and regional anesthesia. I told him, let us co-author it now. I would like you to be the co-author for this chapter. I come back and realize we have lost a very valuable member in our community who was very compassionate. More than anything else, I got a book last year when I came, written by Dr. Raja Sabapati, the surgeon, and he's the owner of Ganga Hospitals, right? And it just amazes me how dedicated Dr. Butt was. He will go early hours of the morning, and he initiated the paradigm of block before the patients come to the OR, on arrival blocks, which is fantastic. I cannot launch it in Canada. I'm trying it, but it's extremely difficult because nobody wants to go to the ER to give those blocks and be responsible for the patient. Whereas this person, as a single individual in a busy trauma hospital, has provided the best of care so that you take care of the immediate post-operative pain in a good way so that they will have much less post-operative pain months and years later, not knowing that he will get remunerated for what he has done, which is absolutely phenomenal. I can't describe how emotional that makes me. In Canada and US, we always ask, how much am I going to get paid for it? What is my remuneration? $50, $100? And that is number one for performing blocks nowadays. But this gentleman gave way beyond what an average North American would give for care of the patients. With all my respect to him, I'm humbled, but I'm going to say what is there beyond the operating room. I've got some declarations of conflict to declare. I have received honoraria from B. Braun in 2013 received honorarium from Arrow Teleflex, being their medical advisor in 2013. I've received free Sonocal kits from Payang for a research study of mine. I've had peer-reviewed grants from PSN, PSI and CAHR, as well as Lawson Institute for my spine studies. But my talk will not be tarnished by that. Let us define where is beyond OR. So beyond OR is just not the door of the OR and beyond, but it spills into the community. So I'm going to kind of narrate where I will discuss regional anesthesia can be practiced. It could be practiced in the post-anesthesia care unit. I don't, I don't want to badmouth my surgeon. Some of my surgeons will come and say, oh, surgery doesn't hurt. Don't do these blocks. It takes time. It delays my OR. Or they will come and say, unless the patient hurts, he doesn't know that he has had surgery. So they that was very unkind. So some of those patients will come to my BSU with a lot of pain because they haven't had a preoperative block. And the patient can develop pain in the wards or after they go home. They can have pain in the trauma site. Battlefield could be away from the OR. Emergency room certainly is away from the OR. That's where Dr. Butt initiated his paradigm of preoperative block. Patients can have pain requiring blocks in the ICU, CCU, and if you look at the publications in that area, they are far and in between. I'm just going to narrate my experience with that. And pain clinics are notorious for requiring blocks to be performed. So in the PSU, many times patients may have unanticipated extensive surgery. Some of my surgeons do the laparoscopic colectomy. They will tell me, oh, it's a small incision. It doesn't hurt. Don't bother about your blocks. So they wouldn't even let me stick a needle with the tap lock in those patients, no epidurals in those patients, which I can understand. They put a lot of local, so certainly they don't hurt for 12 hours, and then they will start hurting. But unfortunately, about 25 to 30 percent of them will go for an open. So here I have a patient writhing in pain, not having had any epidurals or anything like that, and we have to help them. And this next thing that happens is, we, we, I work in a teaching hospital. How many of you will have 100% success of epidurals? In my system, that doesn't exist. There is a certain failure rate with epidurals. Missed segments are completely failed or the catheter falling out. Something or other will happen. According to Narinder Rawal, from his audit, 40% of the epidurals are successful. The other 60% can give you trouble. So we are talking about the gold standard for post-operative pain being as effective as 40%. And I stick needles into people every single day to start epidurals. That means I'm at, I must have a plan B in the PSU. So we, have, we use tap, tap blocks, paravertebral blocks, 
In case patients have had a HTO with a lot of pain, we give femoral catheters or popliteal sciatic blocks for those ankle fusions and ankle ORIFs who are in pain in the recovery room. So it starts in that area. And this video kind of shows you about the, some of the blocks that we do. This is the tap block injection, sorry. How do I make it work? Is it working? Okay. This, this slide shows the obturator block. So at some point, I was so proud. I will do a femsciatic catheter, and I'll say, oh, this patient shouldn't have to put in a femsciatic block or a lumbar plexus sciatic block. The patient, lo and behold, will come and say, oh, I'm hurting in my knee. So in those patients, I will bring them, go to the recovery room, and do through the transmuscular um, proximal obturator nerve block. And the next thing I notice is that the patient is snoring, because they had already filled the patient with narcotics. So this block definitely helps. So that is an indication for doing some of the blocks that are useful. And there is also, uh, we do supraclavicular blocks like m &Ms. Everybody gets a supraclavicular block when it comes to hand surgery. We can miss the inferior trunk sometimes, even when you go under the artery and go get the corner pocket. Patients may be in pain, so we may rescue them Somebody didn't approve of the rescue blocks. I certainly approve of the rescue blocks. We'll rescue them in the forearm to get the ulnar nerve in the forearm to rescue the patient with regards to post-operative pain. Not a failed block, but an incomplete block. So this is sometimes patients come following laparotomy or even breast surgery, and they are in agony, and we do paravertebral single-shot blocks. Sorry. Sorry, it doesn't work. Excuse me. Use the, Use the mouse. Okay. That's what I'm trying to do. Sorry, forget about it. I, I can forget about it, showing that block. Okay. So what happens, we just know in the symposium we talked about patients go home with no pain because we have taken care of them very nicely. But some of the single shot blocks which we do, we do more, quite a few single shot blocks. As soon as they go home, as soon as they go home, you wait until about 10 o'clock at night, they will be in agony because the single shot blocks last 12 hours. And the minute they have gone home, they don't have any pain. We advise them to take a little bit of narcotics, but still some of the surgeries are pretty painful, so they will be in agony. So although Halstead 100 years ago put in the supraclavicular dissected catheters and Rosenblatt, it took 1979 for Rosenblatt to introduce continuous peripheral nerve blocks and to Amin and to write about usefulness of continuous interscalene block. And Roy, Steele and Roy Greengrass developed the Quantiplex kit for B. Braun in 1999. And it's around the same time Dr. Narendra Rawal sent patients going home with wound infusions or peripheral nerve block infusions. And we were doing the same thing around the same time in London, Ontario, sending, sending patients going home with continuous regional blocks using those elastomeric pumps. It was quite an experience because they didn't have any on and off switch. Sometimes the patient will open the tap and forget to close it, so the patient will get about 300 milligram of rocuvicane in one go in the, near the sciatic. So there were a lot of problems at that time. But what happened, the industry woke up to it. We demanded certain things, and now I have pumps galore, whether it's elastomeric pump or electronic pump, where I can modify the rate of infusion, bolus, frequency of bolus, lockout intervals, everything can be controlled. So now we do a lot of home regionals. What did this accomplish? It provided them with better quality pain relief. This is regional anesthesia outside of operating room. Ongoing analgesia after the initial block has receded. It allows me to send patients going home from the PACU. Quite a few of our HTOs, which were admitted for two days, now go home by 4 o'clock on the day of surgery. My shoulder arthroplasties go home the same day. And some of my uni knees will go home the same day because of this continuous regional analgesia. 
It provided analgesia for the duration of worst pain, which I believe is about 48 to 72 hours. And it allows pain-free physiotherapy, which is good. What did we pay for such a luxury? Cost of delivery. My hospital will not pay for the pumps. So the patients, I'll tell them, will cost you about $200. If you're willing to pay for it, I'll give you good quality pain relief for two days. And the patients say, oh, sure, go ahead. So they will pay for it. Not everyone can afford, so I have generated a two- or a three-tier healthcare system in a universal healthcare system, which is not good, but one of these days, once I have the evidence, I might manage. And I've got sprouting of pumps and accessories, so I was making instructions to patients. I could not complete it. In the last 10 years, each year we used a different pump. So the pump instructions have to be perfect, otherwise the patient cannot manage it at home and there can be complications at home. If your quadriceps is weak, they can go home and fall and break open, a, break open a freshly implanted knee. That's a complication you have to think about. One of my patients, after wound infusion, went home and had a myocardial infarction at home. So these are the things that we have to be cognizant of. And I quite like the local infusion, local infiltration analgesia for some of these patients, but that has its own problems too. What pumps and block catheters have multiplied. So we've got electronic pumps which perform very predictably, but initial electronic pumps were very bulky. Nowadays we've got all these popsicles that are uh, called ambit pumps, and they come pre-programmed, so I don't have to spend a fortune of time programming them. They can take anywhere from 50 cc's to 500 cc bag, so I can use it for acute post-operative pain or chronic complex regional pain syndrome patients. And originally, this is what we were using. And they weighed at least one kilogram, and the patients refused to carry it along, particularly if you attached a 1,000 cc of local anesthetic. The other problems that we went through was the catheters getting dislodged. So nowadays, we religiously tunnel the catheters, and I fix the catheters. That's a cheap one, and you can have an expensive one like this which you fix onto the patient's skin so that the catheter doesn't get dislodged. But catheter kink can, can happen, so it may make it difficult for the patient to take out. You have to be prepared for all these things. What it means, you have to give proper instructions, pump instructions, rate, diary, select your pumps, local anesthetics, toxic symptoms should be given as an education to the patient. Infection, site infection monitoring has to go with the responsibility of the relative. Catheter removal instructions and photos, contact phone, callback numbers, return appointment and return of pump if you are using an electronic pump, troubleshooting for kinks and leaks, multimodal analgesia, and entry into database. I can't do it alone, so that means I need a whole lot of para paramedical personnel doing all that job for me. So it is not cheap. Yes, the patient pays for it. Yes, the hospital also has to invest in it. Otherwise, it doesn't fly. So that's why um, when Narinda Rawal gave the Labat lecture, yes, it provides good quality pain, but it can be technically challenging and it is labor intensive, expensive home care, but can be provided only in specialized centers. And he didn't think it was going to take off. But unfortunately, what option do I have? I can't extend my single shot blocks, even if I add a dexmedetomidine or clonidine or weird and wonderful stuff, it's going to be just a marginal prolongation of my regional block. And there are other drugs that I could use which might prolong. They are not commonly used and they are not approved for perineural indications such as the bupivacaine, slow acting drugs, long acting drugs. And then comes to the uh, blocks that can be done in the emergency room. That is where Dr. Butt started his best patient care, okay? There were several reasons why we did not send patients going home initially with a femoral block because they all got quad weakness. And nowadays we do what is called the adductor canal block, which does not make the leg weak, provides reasonably good pain relief, so we send them home on adductor canal block. And Dr. Arjun and Ganesh has documented, even in the pediatric population of 1,285 children, they were able to manage the pain better at home with the children. In the emergency room, we get a lot of crush injuries, impalements, which are very painful. 
Supraclavicular blocks are very good and done under ultrasound guidance, relatively safe. Nowadays, with the ultrasound can initiate even the continuous catheter block without pain of peripheral nerve stimulation, will definitely reduce the narcotic use and GA, may obviate ICU admission because it has provided you, it has reduced the narcotic requirement. What about the trauma at the field? War torn areas. Now, with the ISIS blasting so many areas, we all have to be prepared for it. You never know when it will hit you home, right in your heart. When I saw the Taj Hotel being bombed, I was just thinking, I never thought that will happen in Bombay. But it happened. That means we all might be involved in taking care of patients who are involved in terrorism, bombing, and all those accidents. So Pain following battlefield injury is very severe. Trip Buckenmeyer is the one who brought a lot of information regarding this, apart from the group from Miami who went to Haiti when the um, earthquake occurred. They used a regional anesthesia galore, they put in catheters galore, and they were able to transfer the patient beautifully to the ter tertiary care center. What did it do? It reduced the pain scores, allowed better oxygenation because you have dri driven down the narcotic use. It can be used for surgery with minimal hemodynamic disturbance. That means they did a lot of the earthquake trauma only under regional anesthesia. Herb, Richard Herb, Gebhardt has written an article on it, how initially they did not take their ultrasound machine. They went with their neurostimulation, promptly University of Miami, sent some ultrasound machines for them to do those blocks. They did mo mostly under ultrasound guidance and uh, surgery under regional anesthesia. It also reduced the anxiety. Once you reduce the pain, transfer is no more attention, neither for the doctor nor for the patient. It facilitated pain-free transfer to a tertiary care. Infection could be a problem when you do all these procedures in the periphery. This was reported by um, Malcolm, I forget his surname actually. And what he has done is they did continuous peripheral nerve blocks and they had six catheters that got infected. The catheters that got infected were all stimulating catheters. The non-stimulating catheters did not get infection. What it means is at the site when you look at it, it may not show as if it's infected. But when you do a CT or an X-ray, you see gas near the end of the catheters. Patients have escalating pain because the pH there is lower, your continuous infusion doesn't work anymore with a low pH. When you further investigate, it is infection. The incidence is low, but it is not zero. There are a couple of patients that require major surgical evacuation and debridement and everything, so keep that in mind. This topic has been reviewed by Dr. Mark Vandervelde. I highly recommend this article to be read by everyone. He kind of narrates where all you can give the blocks. One of the things that happens is um, when the patient comes into the emergency with a fractured hip, we all go through it every single day, okay? And the minute you move those elderly ladies, they will scream and yell. Some of them may even use abusive language. Oh my God, take your hand away is what they will tell you. So what they wanted to look at was the three-in-one femoral nerve block or the fascia iliaca block. They randomized them, gave them either 25 mil of 0.5% bupivacaine or saline, and they looked at pain scores over four, four hours. Their study is going on only to four hours, not beyond that. What did they note? Definitely improved pain scores, definitely less complications. And you can see in their complication, the hypoxia, numerical reporting score for pain was significantly less. Speed was also better. The parenteral analgesia requirement also was much less. It did not reach statistical significance. And rescue morphine was reduced completely, almost eliminated. That was statistically significant. Hypotension was less with the nerve block. That's not really statistical significance. Nausea, vomiting, everything else was less. But that was only for four hours. Where do I use it? I use it to position my patient for my spinal anesthesia. Most of this uh, fracture neck will be done under spinal anesthesia. The minute you put them on the side, they will be in agony. So I do this block, go have a cup of coffee, come back and then position them, these patients hurt much less. So it allows pain-free positioning for um, spinal anesthesia. And sometimes I don't even go for the femoral nerve. 
I go for what is called the fascia iliaca block. So I will come from the lateral side and I'll just get underneath the fascia iliaca and deliver about 20 to 30 cc's. It takes a little bit longer to kick in, but the patient will be much more comfortable. Many times I'll be called to emerge for shoulder dislocations and it is very simple to do the Very simple to do the interscalene block as a single shot. And quite often in our hospital, the anesthesia resident will go and do the interscalene block. But our, I find one of the problems with that is the follow-up. Yes, you have done a block. In case the patient gets sent home from eMERGE, who is going to follow up? It doesn't reach my registry. So nowadays, we are training our eMERGE physicians to do these blocks themselves, actually. And the other thing that we do is for the hand and forearm surgeries, we do the axillary block. And occasionally we may do a rescue block. Let us presume somebody has come with only the dorsum of thumb injured. They want to suture it. We will do a selective radial block. And for the fracture of ribs, based on Dr. Karmarker's report, we do the PVBs. And that is ultrasound guided, so I'm less concerned about pneumothoraces. And that works like a charm. In our system, first of all, who will do the block? Who will do the follow-up? And you may still need the continuous catheter block to provide the duration of analgesia. And you have to monitor neurovascular function. If somebody is already numbed up and weak, they cannot evaluate the neurovascular function of that limb. How long does it last depends on the local anesthetic they have used. So you have to pay attention to detail. I'm just going to take you to the CCU. I was called once by the CCU in charge. They had a 45-year-old gentleman who was electrocuted. He was working for a telephone company while digging. He hit the live wire. He developed repeated VTAC. They implanted an ICD. And he used to go into tachyarrhythmia with ischemic episodes. He was on heparin infusion and uh, some of the nitroglycerin infusion. So they asked for a cardiac sympathetic block. So I initially went and did a single shot cervical sympathetic block with about 25 cc's of 0.5% marking under ultrasound. Boom. His tachyarrhythmia disappeared and his chest pain disappeared. So and I repeated it three or four times. I even put a catheter in. Finally, he said, no, I will have a sympathectomy is what they decided because we felt it was sympathetically mediated. He had a thoracoscopic sympathectomy, thoracic sympathectomy, and he's free of arrhythmia and angina. And his ICD hasn't triggered in the last three years. So when it comes to CCU, there was another lady with the Prince Metals angina. Again, the same scenario. We gave a cervical sympathetic chain block, and the patient snapped out of the ischemic episodes. Up until that point, we were seeing no end of it. Nitroglycerin, we have maxed out. He, she was on all the four or five drugs, so this really came in handy. What about ICU and CSRU? We had a patient recently who had a coarctation repair and the usual cardiac anesthesia, that means big syringe, small syringe, they extubated him the next day. He was in agony, couldn't breathe, and he was collapsing his lung and consolidating. He was hypoxic. And they had used about 500 micrograms of intrathecal morphine, so he was comfortable for the first day. After that, hell breaks loose, so they call us. So we go and do a single side continuous paravertebral block and he was extubated and he was sent to the floor within six hours. So there is a huge difference when you apply regional anesthesia in the critical care unit. Come to complex regional pain syndrome which is quite often managed by our chronic pain people. It can occur after a minor injury. One of my patients was a young girl. She was taking out a garbage can and there was a broken glass in it that hit the side of her leg and she developed rip-roaring complex regional pain syndrome of her leg. She was in agony, literally in agony. So I used to do lumbar plexus blocks for her and send her home on lumbar plexus blocks. Eventually she had a spinal cord stimulator put in. So it's a genuine problem that bothers so many people. Current opinion and from Britain says don't do blocks on them because if you deafferented, it takes longer for them to get better, which I don't really believe in. I think you can't dump every complex regional pain syndrome in one basket. 
There are the ones which are causalgic, they don't respond to our therapies, but the one that happens soon after traumatic injury definitely responds to regional anesthesia. Trip Buckenmeyer even reported on a patient where they put a peripheral nerve catheter to, in a patient with a neuropathic pain in the, in the field, actually. So in my experience, quite often my surgeons will refer, oh, this patient had um, palmar fasciectomy last week, still complaining of pain, can you, it looks like sympathetically mediated pain, can you help her? So I will put in a catheter, infraclavicular catheter, send her home on seven or 10 days worth of infusion, they, she will come back much, much better having undergone physiotherapy. It will recrudescent again after about 10, 15 days of break. I'll blast her again. So three such blasts, she will snap out of the symptoms of complex regional pain syndrome. So it is a useful technique, but in specific kinds of complex regional pain syndrome. And some of the other areas where we do the blocks will be in the chronic pain area will be cervical sympathetic block and lumbar sympathetic blocks, medial branch blocks, greater occipital nerve block. I have been involved in a few of them because they get this occipital neuralgic pain, which they cannot sleep. The minute the head touches the pillow, they are in agony. So you bring them and do the uh, occipital nerve block, greater auricular nerve block, supra and infraorbital blocks, intercostal blocks, and lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block. The last one is very common in my clinical practice. It's done with ultrasound. And the patient sometimes will say, oh, I want to hug you. Last night I slept for the first time without the bed sheets bothering me. So it, these are nice things to do for the patients, okay? And the suprascapular nerve block, sometimes they, my surgeons will ask me to identify when they do the rotator cuff repair which tendon is involved. So we will go nerve by nerve by nerve to identify which are the things that he has to look for to repair the rota torn rotator cuff. So with regards to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve block, I do it with ultrasound. So I do it in lacuna musculorum. That is the sartorius. This is the tensor fascia lata fascia lata, and that's my lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, and you can see it much better here. It's a single injection with 40 milligrams of triamcinolone, and patients are very happy following such an intervention. In conclusion, regional anesthesia can be used in the perioperative period, preoperative period, as pioneered by Dr. Bart, can be used postoperatively in various areas, starting from the immediate post-op period all the way to the chronic pain area, it can be done in emergency rooms, CCU and ICU, a trauma site and triage, pain clinics, and I think sky is the limit. I wish to thank the executive of AORI for inviting me and for giving me this honor of presenting this talk. I have not done justice to the innovation Dr. Butt initiated. As I confessed, I tried introducing it in London, Ontario. I am swamped with the political overtones and uh, follow-up of patients and things like that. I, so I took the shortcut. I'm training the ER physicians to do it properly. That is a much better option for me than me going and doing the blocks. But I really, really, really admire Dr. Butt having initiated it, not yesterday. How many years ago? Was it about 15 years ago that he did? It's unbelievable, actually. Ultimately, we are all here to help the humanity in pain. So whatever it takes for us to take our expertise to as far as possible is worth the show. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ganpati. I would also like to thank Dr. Vishnu Panigrahi and Dr. Jayashree Sood for being the chairpersons for this session. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite on stage a few people. Uh, Dr. J. Balavenkat Subramaniam, Dr. TVS Kopal, Dr. Rushali Pandey, Dr. Sandeep Divan, Dr. Deep Arora, and Dr. Om Prakash. May we have all these people on stage, please, for the... May I request Dr. Satish Kulkarni, the trustee and the treasurer of AYRA, to join us. Uh, it's indeed um, a humble tribute that we could 
pay for one of the finest uh, regional anesthesiologists of this country who mastered the technique and delivered it so accurately and meticulously. And it was befitting that a person of the repute of uh, Dr. Suvanta Ganapati to deliver this uh, second Dr. Avindra Bhatt Memorial Oration, which we started last year. It's indeed a great pleasure uh, to uh, present this uh, oration award to Madam Dr. Suganda Ganapati. I also request the Joint Secretary of AORA, uh, Dr. Ashit Mehta, to join us on stage. The fourth national conference of Academy of Regional Anesthesia of India held between the 19th and the 21st September 2014 at New Delhi. The second ABO RA Dr. V. Ravindra Bhatt Memorial Oration awarded to Professor Dr. Suganta Ganapati, Canada for <laughs> achieving excellence in regional anesthesia signed by the co-committee members of AORA and the organizing chairman and secretary of this meeting. On behalf of each one of you here, we deem it a great privilege and honor to present this oration award to Madam Ganapati. We'll have a short 15-minute uh, break for tea. Uh, there seems to be some uh, uh, voting monitors which have been uh, voting, voting pads which have been taken from the other uh, room. In case anyone uh, has them, would you please return them here? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session on teaching, training, and research in regional anesthesia. Uh, there are two parts of it. One is the talk followed by a panel discussion. And the talk is going to be delivered by Dr. Ravi Mahajan. Okay, the first slide. Uh, Ravi came to us as a very young, enthusiastic young man from PCI and worked with a senior resident. He was very enthusiastic, very humble, very polite, and in spite of being a very famous, wise man, he still maintains that character is wonderful. Ravi, please. Thank you, Professor Pawar and Professor Rashiri. It's um, always a pleasure to be here in Delhi, um, the place where I was born and brought up. Um, but what I'm going to talk today is um, rather serious, rather off the beat, not the theme of the day um, kind of topic, the academic misconduct in publishing, 
But what I was encouraged to see today was that almost every talk that we heard today had some evidence to show, some papers to show. And I would like you to pause for a few seconds and think if any of those papers were the outcome of some kind of misconduct, if the results could not be trusted, then all the faith that the speakers had put in those talks and all the faith that the audience has put in learning from those talks and going back to the practicing world and practicing them on the patients will be completely on the false grounds. And therefore, I think it is relevant that we should talk about research misconduct um, because we put so much credence on the, on the evidence. I bring you greetings from, uh, this is where I've been for the last 25 years, uh, University of Nottingham, famous for D.H. Lawrence and, and his works, um, but also for um, the tales of Robin Hood. Whether Robin Hood ever existed, I don't know, but the tales do exist. So does Nottingham. And this is taking you back 5,000 years ago, so these are the tablets of stone still preserved in museum in Xi'an in China where people had actually, before the paper was discovered and the printing was discovered, people used to communicate by writing or by inscribing on tablets of stone. And this was done 5,000 years ago. And of course then paper came in and people started using paper to communicate to other people. And now, of course, we've, we're moving very quickly to the digital world, and the world is changing. And we are, I'll be surprised if in 10 years' time from now, any of the journals or the mainstream journals will exist in the paper form. But it doesn't matter whether they are tablets of stone or paper or, or, or the digital world, the desire of one human be able to communicate to another has always been there and will always be there. And within that desire and within that communication, there is this element of trust. And if that is gone, then the whole communication and the basis completely goes away. So why do we publish? In medicine, of course, we, we publish so that the knowledge is enhanced, ultimately to help our patients. But that brings the responsibility that whatever we publish has to have element of integrity with it. And the integrity comes from carefully considered research question, using appropriate methodology to answer that question, coming with results which are honest reproduction of what you found, so that other people can also do the same and find the same results, and appropriate analysis and interpretation, within human limitations, of course. That is what the elements of integrity are. But when we ask our authors, this is a survey with British Journal of Anesthesia did, ask their authors as to why do they publish. These are the, these are the replies we get, because it's relevant. It's relevant to publish. It has an impact. And you generally feel, like, you know, every time you get a new journal or, a, or journal coming through to your doors every, every month, you have this element of stability through improvements that the world is all right, you know. Um, of course, authors want to establish themselves as leaders in their field. There's an element of esteem. It helps careers and makes you feel generally happy. So that's the author's perspective. But of course, if you ask the reviewers and the editors, they want to see the papers which reflect truth. They want to publish something that people should be able to trust. And of course, it should have potential to enhance knowledge and improve current situation. 
Here are some of the examples. You may have heard about them. You may have um, read about them. If not, go on Wikipedia. So I'm not breaking any news. Um, th th these names are there. And these are, I must say, tip of the iceberg. And these high-profile cases, what they've shown to us is that the commonest way among these cases of misconduct was either falsifying or fabricating data or conducting studies which were contrary to what they originally thought they were going to do in terms of ethics approval. Many of these studies have been retracted and some, of, some are still in process of being retracted. And of course, when you have such um, misconduct ongoing, the society makes its own judgments. And they come to conclusions which you or may or may not agree, but that may be true. As professionals, we probably are a bit more relaxed with our colleagues, but society has a very different view about it. So let's look at, just as an introduction, what are the different ways in which academic misconduct has been or can be uh, conducted. Fabrication, falsification, unethical studies, plagiarism, very, very common. Uh, Self-plagiarism or multiple publications from same data or same set of data, authorship problems or excessive self-citations, all are I mean, you can argue that there are soft boundaries and the gray areas, the 50 shades of gray, but they all have um, some element of misconduct in it. Here is the examples. Here are the examples of fabrication. Um, Reuben Scott, as for example, it was a routine audit in his hospital that found out that the studies which were published were actually never conducted. They were never even approved by ethics committee. And the, so they found that clinical trials which went in the name of the organization and were published in the name of the organization actually never happened. So that's how it was picked up. It wasn't picked up by a journal, but by routine investigation or audit from the hospital itself. One could falsify data to fit um, you know, your own bias so that the reflection that comes out of data is better or more publishable. Um, examples here, bold, many examples, but certainly two in which I have personally investigated where studies were published and they were based on a PhD thesis. But when you look at the PhD thesis, uh, you, you do not see the control group uh, data as it was published in the paper. Also, they had added in one of the papers an additional group which wasn't an original thesis. So that's how they came into light. But again, it was that the investigation wasn't started by the journals, but they were started because of the complaints to the, um, to the authorities within their own department. Many examples of unethical studies where either the animal experiments have not been conducted to the standard or you submit a protocol to ethics committee but you go on and do something very different. Sometimes no evidence even that the ethical committee approval ever was sought. So somebody simply went on to do a study without any approval. Plagiarism is quite common. We come across this very, very often where maybe willfully or maybe unknowingly paragraphs or texts have been taken out from some other paper and have been cut and pasted in your own paper. And people do that for review articles, for case reports, quite often. And from countries where English is not the first language or, or mainstream language, um, it's, a temp it's quite tempting for authors, as you can imagine, to do that. Sometimes, if you are picking up data from somewhere else or picking up the whole of the section, that, you could say, is, is not very good practice, but we are quite relaxed uh, if the plagiarism appears to be innocent. And I'll, I can talk about that later on. But plagiarism is easier to pick up. There are softwares which will look at cross-referencing, um, uh, cross 
and they will look at whether or not there is duplication in the text. And in the BJA, we look at the text and we see if, if it's about 20% uh, duplication, mainly in references, a little bit in introduction or, or methodology, we allow that. But if the results are picked up, then of course it's misconduct. Authorship problems are important. Uh, I think gone are the days when you as head of the department could expect your name to be on every paper that went out from your department. Um, after Rubin's and Bolt's case, cases, um, when the co-authors were asked if they knew about the studies, they all denied. And it is very difficult to believe that there have been 30 or 40 papers which have been published in your name with you as co-author and you never having to know about it. So when you are a co-author, you are equally responsible for the data, not just the first author or the corresponding author. Every author bears equal responsibility. So if someone is just putting your name as giving you gift authorship but has falsified data, you are equally culpable. In the eye of um, society or, or, or a court judge, you are no different to any other author because you're quite happy to take the, take the credit for it. Um, you cannot devolve the responsibility. Self-citations. We're all a little bit guilty of it. If, if we've written a paper on a topic and we're writing paper or review article on the same topic, we like to quote our own selves. But doing it excessively sometimes, you think, well, you know, do you have to cite yourself so many times? It is quite tempting because your H factor goes up, your bibliometrics goes up, and, and it's, it's good for your ego. One has to be you know, aware of um, the, the soft line between doing it uh, legitimately or, or, or crossing the line. Twelve references to different chapters of one book. Now that can be, um, as you can see, the extreme example. So all this raises questions for you. So what are the implications for clinical practice if the papers are retracted after they're found to be falsified or come out of misconduct? A technique, let's say, has been established or is being established People have invested money and time and effort into establishing certain kinds of practice and you find that the evidence is flawed. What is the role of co-authors? I think I alluded a little bit. And what about other papers by the same authors? Can you trust them? And what can journals do about research fraud? What we do is we, journals do not have legal authority. So you rely very much on the trust, but also you rely on the peer review process and some index of suspicion. Often the problems are raised by the authors uh, in their letters and that arouses suspicion and you go and investigate. We do have certain standards whereby we make sure that the trial was registered, the trial underwent proper ethics approval and it meets certain international guidelines to make sure that you can trust the methodology. We do have guidance for the authorship, guidance for declaration of conflicts of interest and funding sources, and that's as far as we go. Anything beyond that, it's very difficult for journals to detect. So we very much rely on, auth on, on the readers to say, well, actually, I work in the same hospital. I never saw this study being performed. As I said, researchers do it because it's quite tempting for your promotion, for your career, for your fame. Uh, and perhaps you're just lazy, too bothered. The study is too bothersome to conduct, so why not just write it up? And from a editor's point of view, on a reassuring note, I would like to say in the end that vast majority of manuscripts that we receive are actually entirely free of academic mass misconduct. So everything you've heard today you can, you can have hand on heart is, is, is okay, as far as we can tell. We receive over 1,000 um, manuscripts per year, and only very few are rejected on plagiarism grounds or ethics concerns. And most of the times, the plagiarism appears to be innocent. We ask authors to alter their text and resubmit. And that's, if that reassures you, then I would like to end here. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ravi. Any questions for Ravi? We'll take the questions now because the other is a panel is a different topic. Yes, Ansem. Yeah, no, incentive to publish is, uh, it, it's, um, that's fine, but the publication has to be, you know, result of a properly conducted study or properly conducted academic work. I, I completely agree with you. I'm still, uh, you know, uh, trying to see that there's an incentive because the incentive here is the better, work, you know, results, which means positive results get published more oh, often. Okay. Well, I, I see your point. No, I think uh, um, if the hypothesis is correct and the methodol is, is appropriate and methodology is correct, irrespective of the results, we would publish. Um, I think that's true of um, all editor-in-chiefs in mainstream journals. We, we meet very often. And you will see now um, that the number of negative result studies are on the rise in all mainstream journals, whether you look at anesthetic journals or outside anesthesia journals. What has to be looked at really is, is the methodology and the hypothesis. Results, in fact, don't matter because results are what you found and it's up to you how you discuss them. Um, there are many positive result studies which are rejected on the basis of bad methodology. So therefore, I think that attitude, by and large, in my view, has changed. Still there, there's... It, is tempting. it yes. is tempting to show that you found a positive result. And that, I think, is very much up to the author bias as well. Because when you made an hypothesis, you believe that certain technique is going to work. And it's in your... Then somehow that bias has to be... And th that is where the methodology and the transparency comes in. And what statistics have been applied with regards to interpreting the results and coming to conclusion? Knowing statistics to some extent, people can make it work or not work to their advantage. And um, why so much stress on statistics? To some extent, I understand. But to the extent they can drive you crazy, and some of them come out with this weird and wonderful, excruciatingly devious ways of proving a particular point, and yeah. the journals still publish it. Yeah, if it, I mean, there are certain aspects of statistics which are quite complicated. And if the techniques are complicated, and especially the, the public health study type of studies, the meta-analysis, which are, you know, quite a sophisticated statistical kind of exercise. But by and large, if the results are not really obvious to you, try and use sophisticated statistics to prove is probably not the right way of doing things. Now, if you say why journals have um, put um, so, much, um, so much emphasis on statistics, that depends on which journal we talk about. There are some journals which have statistical editors, so that every um, article which is close to being uh, accepted then has to undergo a statistical review. In BJA, we've discussed this so many times, we have come to conclusion that if an editor and a reviewer cannot understand, then our reader probably is not going to understand either. So we might as well ask authors to explain uh, or, or, or use some simpler statistics. So I think it's, it, it all depends which journal we're talking about. Statistics is important, and certain data are so complex where there are dropouts, you know, you, you wanted to recruit 30,000 patients, you only come up with 2,700, and you have to make sense of that data. That is different. But um, by and large, simple, straightforward, randomized, double-blind clinical trials should not have very complicated statistics. I agree. Thank you. Um, uh, Professor Mahajan, I, I truly enjoyed your talk. I think you made a 
A very important uh, comment in your talk, and I think I totally attest to that. And being a researcher myself, and uh, teaching uh, research to people, PhDs, I think uh, integrity, as you mentioned, is a, is a word I truly appreciate, and I think every researcher or any person wishing to publish should keep that in mind. I always say this to my, my, my fellow researchers included, saying that if you don't have integrity, someday the truth will prevail. When the truth prevails, we may be in a box somewhere. So would you like to be that when somebody ridicules you? But that's by the way, but I think integrity certainly. But what I uh, would like to make a comment, because you being at the position that you are, and I congratulate you for that, is a lot of thing goes into, especially the cases uh, of Scott Rubin and Bolt, etc., is there were ethical concerns in this, and there are ethical concerns in, in many papers that are published uh, to your journal included. And uh, I often get approached by certain editors saying, could you help us investigate this, as you would do uh, and ask people. Why isn't that journals and uh, the chief editor, or you have a system where before the paper goes into review process, they approach the ethics committee of that particular institution. And I, I, I certainly, when I submit papers now, whether it is asked or not, we put in a couple of sentences saying this is the ethical committee, this is the number, and this is the telephone number. Would you think that would go a long way in maintaining the responsibility that we as researchers and you as the editors yeah. uh, have? I, I think this is something. You're absolutely right. And I think in BJA especially, um, it's now mandatory that when you submit your clinical trial, um, then you have to, that trial has to have a clinical trial registration number from an international registry. And you, you register on international registry a trial after it's gone through ethics approval. So therefore, by having a, a publicly open registry with your trial registered on it, you in a way ensure that, that it has gone through that process. The problem really is, is that different countries and different places, even within the same country, have different ethical standards. Um, a, a study may have been approved in, in Cumbria, as for example, in the UK, and a person from London say, it will never go through my ethics committee. And how do you deal with that? I think that is an issue. The, uh, but you're right, in the past, uh, we never insisted on clinical trial registration numbers. We never insisted on ethics approval uh, numbers so that you could go back to the societies and, and that had, had to be fixed. Thank you, Ravi. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm so happy you're growing your beard. We move on to the next panel discussion. And I'll request to Rajasvili to invite and introduce the panelists. Good afternoon. Uh, so now we come to a very important uh, part of today's afternoon's discussion. This is a panel discussion on uh, regional anesthesia, the training and teaching and research aspects, which are often uh, not discussed in detail. So I would uh, request the panelists to please come up to the dais one by one. Dr. Bala Venkat. This is something for the slide. No? Dr. Balavenkit works in the, at the Ganga Hospital in Coimbatore, and uh, he's a very well-known figure in um, India and abroad. And um, he's a very uh, important part of most regional anesthesia workshops and conferences. Please sit down. Dr. T.V.S. Gopan. Dr. T.V.S. Gopal. Please go back. I think you've got to. Uh, yes. Dr. Gopal is the HOD of the Department of Anesthesia at um, uh, Surgical at Care Hospitals, Banjara Hills. And he's also an academic director in the AORA. And uh, he's also a very well known figure in India and um, has. Uh, 
contributed a lot to regional anesthesia and its practice in our country. You've skipped one, I think, one more. Fast forward again. It keeps like that. Dr. Manoj Karmakar needs no introduction. Uh, he is at the moment uh, from uh, working in um, the Department of Pediatric Anesthesia at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And um, he uh, is uh, credited with uh, organizing a large number of uh, regional anesthesia workshops. And um, he is published very widely in terms of regional anesthesia and we would uh, love to hear from him. Next slide, please. Now I invite Dr. Uh, Sean Flack who's from the Seattle um, uh, uh, Children's Hospital, and he's an associate professor there at the Department of Anesthesiology. He's um, published, started publishing recently, but um, he's also would be very important to hear from him what he thinks about uh, regional anesthesia and its practice in children. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I invite Dr. Anshuman, who... Uh, is uh, originally coming from the institution where I come from. And at the moment, he is a, a professor of anesthesiology and director of pediatric anesthesia in the Washington University School of Medicine. And um, he is a very um, vital uh, person in this uh, conference because he has a lot to contribute in terms of uh, the aspects because he also um, uh, looks after the quality control in his hospital and I think that will have a lot of relevance in this kind of discussion. I invite Dr. Sukanda. Um, uh, she's from uh, Canada, I think. Mm. Oh, no, no, she's not from. Uh, no, Welcome, Dr. Sukanda. Uh, I think you are.